Hey guys, hope you're doing all right with the uh, social social isolation. Of course, we in IT were kind of already prepared for this, and I hope you're staying safe and healthy. Um, this is going to be the recording for the WAN chapter, WAN, and there's going to be a quiz available. And uh, yeah, let's go. So let's see. I want my PowerPoint's open. Let's do this. Okay, so when is wide area network? Why do we want to talk about it? Because we're so bored. We want to identify all the uses for it. We're going to compare the tech that you, you make it out of and talk about the transmission methods, all of them, from the bottom on up to the top. So, we use this term, WAN, when we're describing a network that traverses a lot of distance. We've been talking about WANs the entire semester. Whenever we talk about a network between two cities that's huge, we're talking about a WAN, right? Now we're going to talk about how it actually works. So the transmission method depends on how much you can afford, how much your business needs. And let's see, LANs connect small nodes, WANs connect networks. Remember this principle of you know, routers connect two networks together, switches just form one little network. It's the same principle on a big scale. So um, LAN wiring is typically privately owned. Like John A owns its little network and all the equipment on campus, but it doesn't necessarily own the stuff that it's connected to, to the ISP. That's owned by them. And due to a complicated set of laws and stuff, it's partially publicly owned too. Um, we'll get more into that in net neutrality and what that implies later. So, all right, geographic sites connected by LAN, yes. Communication between a WAN site and another site is a WAN link, correct. Now here's a part that I always mix up and I have to look it up, is the your endpoint, like, John A. Logan's equipment that connects us to the internet is our data terminal equipment. Terminal meaning the internet connection to the rest of the WAN technically ends there and then we share it with everybody on campus. So remember, terminal is the end of the public equipment. Okay, that's our equipment. And then the to them, to the other side, to Mediacom, to Frontier, to Time Warner, whoever you're buying your internet from, the last piece of their equipment between them and you is their communication equipment. So the carrier's endpoint device is data communication. So remember, yours is DTE and theirs is DCE. Okay? It's complicated and uh, you often forget it. This is kind of a map of what this looks like. Like you can see your little computers are down here. You guys connect to a switch. That's connected to a router. Maybe that connects to some servers locally or distant, but eventually you're going out on the internet then you are going WAN to WAN. This is all one big WAN, these cities, New York to San Francisco to Miami. It's technically one big wide area network, okay? And the way this DTE, DCE thing looks is like this could be us here at John A over on the left, and that's our terminal equipment. Then the internet provider's communication equipment connects us to everything on the internet. Craigslist, doesn't matter, Frontier, Verizon. And then we head over to the uh, DCE at SIU, then we connect to SIU's data terminal equipment, and then we're connected to them. Then we can share files back and forth and spam each other with memes. So quality of service, QoS, is built into even the cheapest router you could buy these days has it. It measures a lot of things. It measures how many packets are being lost. What's the speed you're supposed to be going? What's the speed you're actually going? What's your ping? What's the availability of stuff? How quickly does it respond? And then you prioritize particular types of traffic. Like in my house, I have a bunch of Netflixers. And during the quarantine, they like, they like to Netflix. Sometimes I think they might be Netflixing on two or three devices at once. You know, it's said that millennials can consume two forms of entertainment at once and, you know, comprehend neither of them. So they're Netflixing, but I want to play video games and I'm very ping sensitive. I want speed and, and responsiveness. So in the router, I quality of service, I prioritize video game traffic over network traffic. They don't notice. It just worst case scenario, they buffer for an extra split second when I'm playing. So 
doesn't really hurt them and my traffic always goes as fast as a router possibly can and then it worries about Netflix after that that's quality of service prioritization okay that's why you want to do it it actually makes a difference so WAN topologies we're gonna to use the same terms that we use for small LAN topology you know star bus all that stuff but it's a little different the way it's applied okay we talk about how much distance can we cover how many people can we have on it and what happens when traffic gets heavy okay now bus topology we talked about it was kinda of obsolete in um, small networks because you know we just don't build networks that way anymore if one piece goes the whole thing is kinda of down but when you have your say you have your main company at 210 Main Street you want to connect to the Oak Street um, branch you just run a wire to it you got DSL from here to there but the Charles Street branch is like a block away so we can afford a T1 line to that much faster we'll get into detail about T1 and then Charles Street to First Street for some reason they have a T3 available why not it's even faster so we have different pieces different technologies connecting our different buildings but technically this is a bus topology because it's all in a line it's serial okay super serial um, yeah late night slides again so um, if you wanted to go from here to here from the Oak Street to the first street you can't do what Darth Vader on the Segway is doing here you have to go to Charles Street to the main building and then to Oak Street okay and if you don't like that we have other topologies for you we have ring topology which is where you build one more one more little line down there at the bottom that allows you to kind of go anywhere you want, any direction you want in the circle, but you cannot jump still from this one to this one. Uh, again, ring topology kind of gone from the small network design area, but still exists in situations like this. You connect your businesses the best way you can afford to, and bus and ring are typically cheaper. It's uh, a smaller subscription fee. So star is more what you want. This is getting closer to what we want you have a single site that is a central connection point and then everybody connects up to that um, if that single site is up you're usually good one of the little satellite parts can fail you know any one of these little guys can fail and the rest of the network is fine now if main street goes down everybody's down so still kind of a, a weakness there which is where we get to mesh topology and my god it's much more complicated it gets a little meshy Ha! I left a pause in there for you to laugh. Um, but it's connected. Everybody's connected to everybody. Every which way they can be. It's completely fault tolerant because now we're connected like this, right? If this building goes down, these have their own connection. These have their own connection. Anything can fall apart and the rest of it will still work. So much more fault tolerant on that mesh topology. And that's kind of what the internet starts to look like eventually is one gigantic mesh topology where you know um, London has thousands millions of connections and if any one of them goes down it'll hop on a different one so very very connected each one of these cities these WANs are giant mesh topologies eventually they didn't start that way but they're that way now and then there's tiered this is really just a combination of the others um star or ring here where's the map of it yeah we'll just look at a map of it this explains it you can see i sort of have a star to these little guys and then i have a, a sort of a serial to these three so it's a mix of technologies okay that's what tiered is an example of an old wan would be the uh, telephone network you know um when most of you and even i was born this was the only WAN in the in the world so um, it looked like this people actually had to sit there and plug in person A to person B and they had to be able to look at this switchboard and understand it we sort of obsoleted this with the first creation of the the modern internet like uh, routers and stuff like that they automatically do this part for us okay we still call it the plain old telephone service I guess pots I've never heard anybody call it that but I don't really deal with it much it's the whole telephone service. It only does analog traffic, meaning you can talk on it. That is all. You cannot send an email over it. Okay. And the CO is where a telephone company terminates lines. That's sort of like the CTE, DTE thing. Okay. 
Now, it started to get pretty sophisticated towards the sort of end of it. I mean, it still exists. People still use it. You know, some people have landlines. Businesses still have landlines. But um, my buddy that I hope to get as a guest speaker in a few weeks works for ClearWave, and they they just run Internet to everybody and put Internet-capable phones in your office. So they don't really need this at all anymore. Let's see. Um, can use optical. This is a good map of how it works. So you run optical from your main building to these units that cover a bunch of other buildings. Branch out like that. Okay? That's the idea. Okay, T carriers. This is the next level of wire and box and protocol and design beyond what we know. This is beyond routers and switches. This is in a bigger stuff. The T stands for transmission. And this includes stuff like T1s, T3s. You might have heard of those before. I'm um, not sure exactly what John A. has. SIU's Internet Connection is like a combination of a, a T3 from one company, a T3 from another, and like two T1s from another company. And we have a, a system that balances all of those and, and can engage more of them at, at need if we need to. Um, so it sort of balances all of that stuff for us. It's cool. All right. They spef specify a method of signaling... They are a physical layer operation. Yeah, we don't need most of that. Okay. So these guys, it's cool because they use the same real, it looks like patch cables, okay? It looks like Ethernet cable, which you're very familiar with. It uses a RJ48 connector instead of 45, but it looks the same, very similar. And you can connect your branch offices this way. So you, it has a longer range, obviously, than Ethernet because we know Ethernet only goes 300 feet, right? And the costs vary wildly, but one T1 line, because it was originally designed with phones in mind, has 24 channels on it. 24 different phone calls can happen on it. So if you're a business and you had 20 phones, you would buy one T1 line, and that's how everybody would get their phone service. If you live in an apartment building, there's one technically like a T1 line that runs to your apartment building so that everybody can have their own phone line if they want it, or at least it used to. T3 is orders of magnitude bigger and is designed with internet in mind. Like the T1 was adapted to internet, sort of like phone lines went from analog to digital. We're like, we're going to send boop beep pop over this instead of just talking over it. Well, T3 is different because by the time we were designing it and building it, the internet was already a thing. And we're like, oh, no, we, we have to think about data this time. We can't just think about phone calls. So way more bandwidth. Look. 1.5 megabits. Okay. Uh, 45 million? What? It's just not even comparable. Um, here's a list of them. You can see the progression. Again, we invent a thing and then we iterate on it and improve it over time. Make it better. Uh, can be shielded or not. Shielded goes a little farther, of course. It can be coax. You can use uh, microwave transmitters, fiber optic. It doesn't matter. It's basically a protocol. It's a it's a, it's a language, not a physical thing. And multiple T1s or T3, yeah, you can run it together. So runs over copper. This is close to the end of it. You run RJ48s. These are RJ48s right here. They look like Ethernet connectors, right? They're extremely similar. Uh, basically, they are. So you can do crossover cables. Same tricks you can do with ether Ethernet. You could connect two devices with a crossover. Uh, I think I have a map coming up. And then, of course, it has a little modem-like device that translates from T1 into 20, 24 different Ethernet lines coming out the side. There's a better view of the RJ48. Okay. Here's a map of what that looks like. Terminal equipment, that means it's your stuff. Here's the CTEs, their stuff. That connects them to the internet and other other CTEs and eventually other terminal equipment. And that's, to date, that's the most sophisticated example or description that we've seen of how the internet works is, is T1s, T3s. We're gonna get into, a, there's, even, there's an even bigger fish beyond T1 and T3, but beyond, beyond T carriers. So, and again, it uses multiplexing technology. There's a bunch of different channels going on on this one wire, and we split it. We, we can separate it, control it, and manage that. The terminal equipment does it. And DTE is technically a router. 
So on one side, it's speaking T1, and on the other side, it's providing Ethernet for everybody in the room or in the building. Okay? Looks like this. Here's the Internet. Here's the T3 coming in. This box has a T3 connection on one side and then regular old Ethernet out to a switch. It also has phone jacks to connect to a telephone because remember this stuff can be used for phone like landlines. And then eventually we're on computers and they don't know how they're getting online. They're just online and happy to be so. Okay, DSL. We've all heard of it. Maybe some of us own it now. I'm sorry. Uh, we used to have it and it is digital subscriber line. It competes with T1 and broadband. It was the most affordable widespread early broadband because you could multiplex it to people over their existing phone lines. So they would say, hey, hook up this doodad to your phone jack and then hook up your phone to this doodad and you're going to have internet coming through your phone line and it's going to blow your mind how fast it is. Well, compared compared to like a 28.8 modem, it was amazing. It was wonderful. Um, and cable came along and other things came along, you know, Google Fiber. If we ever get fiber in Southern Illinois, I'm, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. It'll be a glorious day. So DSL was really good for a while, but it's kind of limited. You can't run it too far out of town. Um, yeah, you have to do it like this. Like I just said, here comes the internet. Here's your phone jack. We're basically pumping the internet into your phone jack, whether you know it or not. And until you put this little DSL filter on, you're not using it. The phone will just like scramble it and kick you off if you got on without it. So it separates the phone traffic, again, multiplexing, splitting into different purposes. And then it comes to a DSL modem, which then gives you Ethernet, Wi-Fi, whatever you need. Okay. And then the device that the reason you'll often hear when you talk to DSL that it only has a range of two miles is when they set up this um, it's a DSLAM. It's the big multiplexer. This is like, okay, we're going to connect the internet up to these phone lines. And it multiplexes all the voice onto those phone lines and the internet. And that allows us to just like run it over your existing line without running a new wire to your house. And hmm. it only carries for about two miles. So like my parents are in Macanda. They are at like 2.1 miles on their DSL and it's very slow and it dies sometimes because they're just at the upper limit and the company could have just said no but I, it's better that they said yeah we're going to give this to you but it's going to suck and it's going to be 30 bucks a month so big deal um but yeah when you're at the range limit of dsl it's not great when you're close to the center of it you're like in town it's okay it's more stable then although mine used to knock off every time it rained which means that there was a box outside exposed to water and would fill up with water and then my connection would die took me for I don't think I ever convinced Verizon that they needed to fix it I just switched to cable and I've been much happier so speaking of cable it combines a couple different things it comes in on coax of course you know they have to either lay the cable to your house or run it on your electric pole to your house um, but you actually have to have that wire pulled it's separate and it can multiplex we already know that from our previous sections cable can have phone traffic on it it can have TV channels it can have internet. It's pretty good at internet, really, until they, you know, overload your neighborhood and don't add enough new, um, new bandwidth to the area. Uh, yeah, it is better than DSL. So this translates between the coax cable and your regular old local in your house boop beep bop to your Wi-Fi router or whatever, and operates at the physical and data layer. Okay. The infrastructure required for this is you do have to have coax. You want to have a fiber link supporting because it because it goes faster than DSL, which means it's better. You have to hook it up to a bigger, fatter internet pipe. Otherwise, there's no point in having it. Mm -hmm -hmm. Yeah, dedicated connection. Everyone in the neighborhood technically is sharing the same piece of the internet pie. Part of the reason my internet at my house is so amazing is I'm on cable and I am surround one side of the the opposite side of the street for me is an empty grass field that SIU owns and they have their own internet anyway. So there's nothing on the other side of the street that's going to be on my piece of the internet pie. And all around me 
our retirees, older sort of folks, like old, retired faculty, and they're just not on the internet that much, and they don't stay up late. So in the middle of the night, I have awesome speed, and I'm a happy nerd. Okay. Next level up is where we get into Sonnet. And I don't think we need a ton of detail about this. It's just the next thing up from T1, T3. And it, you end up calling it OC, OC3. Um, it connects multiple WAN sites. Yeah, 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 yeah. Also multiplexers of, multiplexes, of course. And yeah, optical carrier level. Let's see. I think I might have a chart on that. Well, maybe I don't. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So, original OC1, 50 megabits, 150, 600. You're getting into pretty high amounts until you're down to like 40,000 megabits for a big old OC. These are your internet backbone connections. This is the pipe between New York and LA, Chicago to Atlanta, whatever. This is the gigantic, you know, we've talked about this all semester, how the internet has these huge backbone connections between cities. And these are OCs. Um, so they, you've seen this diagram before, although it was a little different, but these are all, you know, OC switches. And this is the internet as we know it. This is, you know, New York, Boston, LA, Chicago, Denver, whatever. Um, each one of those places is going to have a massive connection. Internet 2. Internet 2 is another internet behind the internet that is only allowed to be used for, uh, I think, education purposes, like colleges can use it and stuff like that, SIU's on it. And so when researchers from like Harvard and Stanford want to swap gigantic data files, they can hop on Internet 2 and enjoy less traffic and greater overall speeds. It's something that uh, uh, I think Bill Clinton signed it in law. It's been around a while. Okay, now we have to get into wireless. WiMAX is line of sight, so you set up a transmitter at your house on the roof and you aim it at your buddy's house and he sets up one and then you have an internet connection between the two of you. If one of you has internet, you can share it over the WiMAX, etc, etc. So we had to set one of these up at SIU School of Agriculture because they wanted some kind of data collection. They're doing some sort of study out at the pig farms. There's not a lot of infrastructure out there. It's basically a room full of, you know, pigs. A, room, a field full of pigs in a barn. And so we just went directional. We set up a directional antenna where we had internet. We aimed it at the pig barn. And we set up another one there because we had power is all we had. And then voila, they can do uh, data entry and stuff from the pig barn. How nice. Overpowering smell, though. Uh, savings and benefits? I don't know about that. All right. Rural customers, this might be all you can get. You got to take what you can get when you live way out of town. It's the really the downside to having a nice country house. So, yeah, you see, there's a carrier facility. It transmits to an antenna. It retrain sort of like a repeater. Transmits out to the client. Uh, the newer version of WiMAX is two. It's based on a Wi-Fi, similar uh, a standard that's related to Wi-Fi. Competes with cellular, yeah, backwards compatible. Now, cellular was originally designed for voice, like it, many things, was designed for analog. Today, it does data and voice. The history of it goes 1G, we're like, oh my gosh, we are the coolest. We have gigantic 12 pound cell phones, and we can call from anywhere and receive calls. And it couldn't send data, so phones were literally just phones, like the one this guy's holding. Um, then 2G, we had 240 kilobits. Okay, it's better than a modem. Then 3G, we are up to um, 384. Still not that great. And then 4G, we have a kind of a quantum leap of technology. And 5G is the next thing coming, but it's not built out everywhere. You know, it's it's just not available. Like here, it's not available here. I you know I have a phone that can hop on 5G. And there's no 5G network here, and there's not likely to be. Uh, I'll tell you why in a bit. So these use a couple different technologies, GSM and CDMA. Um, antenna, base station, let's just look at the map. This is your map. You got your, oh wow. Yeah, this is from the book. It's real low res, I'm sorry. But it actually is 
the quickest way to explain this. Central office runs a wire to the mobile switching center and they're connected to all the towers and then those towers keep track of you. Your car, your phone, whatever, the towers find you and connect you to this stuff and then you get online. This has the internet connection. Okay, And then another le level of sophistication beyond that, we go satellite. Um, big honking device floating around in space. We basically throw it as hard as we can around the Earth in space at 17-ish thousand miles per hour, depending on how, uh, depending on its altitude. And it just stays there, continually floating over the same general area um, or orbiting at the same rate that Earth turns. It can provide data service. If you've ever been, if you've ever been on a plane flight that had Wi-Fi, it had a satellite antenna sitting like on top of the plane, and that's talking to a satellite while you're in flight. And then you are getting Wi-Fi off of that. It's sort of, it's like a modem translating the one medium into another. And um, one friend in our circle, we were playing, we were playing Dota two, and he was on a flight from. I want to say St. Louis to Phoenix, and he played an entire game of Dota, like a 45-minute video game with nine other players over airplane internet. It was amazing, and he only DC'd once. He only disconnected one time. It's pretty good. It's come a long way, uh, and it's about to go farther. So, um, they provide a downlink. They have a bunch of transponders. So, yeah, they're pretty high bandwidth, really. This is modern stuff. So the satellite's in orbit over Earth. It's flung around the Earth. Zoom. And then it talks to these uplinks, downlinks separately. And that's how it provides internet. Um, but there's a more advanced version of this coming. So you, if you want to have it, you got to have a small satellite dish receiver. You exchange the signal with that. Yeah, it's asymmetrical, meaning your download speed is way faster than your upload speed. Satellite folks, they can Netflix but they really can't play video games because their ping is terrible, their uplink is terrible, and the download is great. And all you need to watch Netflix is downlink. So, mm-hmm, 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 more latency. Yeah, it's more expensive. Satellite's not ideal, but it might be the only thing you can get. Some of you who live in the country have already kind of fought this battle. So what's coming is something called Starlink. There's other systems that are been proposed like this, but SpaceX propose this um, what they want to do and they've already tested it with I don't know 50 or so satellites is they want to put hundreds of satellites in constant coordinated orbit around the planet and this animated gif in the background is an actual projection of what it'll look like and you see they don't collide with each other but they come near each other and they're, they look like this, a little box with a giant solar panel that folds out once they're dropped into space. And this kind of powers them, keeps them on course with little gyroscopes and stuff. Now they communicate with each other via laser. And they're above most of the atmosphere. They're just above the atmosphere, basically. And that means that light travels faster. When you do light-based data transmission on Earth, the air gets in your way and slows you down. Like all the molecules, oxygen and, and everything, carbon dioxide, it all slows you down. But when you're in space, light, laser communication is completely unimpeded. Basically, it's half as fast in the atmosphere. So you shoot a laser from Colorado to, to an airplane flying over, and it's going to go half as fast as it would if you shot the same exact distance in the void of space. So these things can talk to each other, and you see they pass pretty close to each other. They have five different lasers on them, aim different directions, and they can kind of turn. And so they communicate with each other at light speed. Each one of these things is like a Wi-Fi router or a little router linking up with each other, forming a sort of internet in space. And then they have the ability to contact units on the ground and extend that network to, to, to Earth. So they transmit downwards, and then they're impeded by atmosphere and other types of interference. And uh, yeah, they can do a 500 kilometer area underneath them, their constant motion. The goal here is that these could provide Wi-Fi to everyone on Earth. Everyone, 
no matter where you are. It wouldn't matter rural anymore. You could be in the, in the hills of Cobden and get Starlink, and it would cost the same everywhere in the world. You'd have to buy a little $100 or $200 Starlink box, put it on top of your house, and then you have Starlink. And as long as Starlink is up, you're good. And SpaceX is hoping that they can basically become a planet-wide ISP with this. And here's the other thing they plan to do with it. <clears throat> Aside from selling cheap internet to all of us, they want to sell whatever, like super premium, ultra expensive accounts to giant companies that transmit data across the world. Like the stock exchange between London and New York, right now, um, on the, the best they can hope for, like, they're, like the, the record for the fastest data transfer ever is like 65 or 70 milliseconds. But typically, you're going to see 76 milliseconds. So if you're a stock trader and you're trying to move, you're trying to buy millions of dollars worth of stock at a certain price, it actually does matter how fast your transaction goes through. It's just like when you're buying on eBay and you both try to buy the same old electric guitar at the same time. Whoever's buy order gets there first is going to buy it. And it's either they're going to run out or the price could change or whatever. You might Your buy might not go through. So speed matters, and this is billion. This is a trillion dollar industry. Really, is the finance industry. So SpaceX thinks they can sell hyper fast transmitted data from anywhere on the Earth to anywhere else on the Earth, and they say that. And this is in theory. I don't know if they've actually tested this yet, because most of the trip is done with the laser. Like say you did New York to L.A you transmit up into the sky that is slowed by the atmosphere and then it's laser beamed from each of these uh starlink things across the continent to the west coast and that travel is so much faster than even wired internet on on the on the ground because it's going at full light speed not half it's going amazingly fast so this increases transfer speed, and then, of course, it has to transmit it back to Earth. But the end result is they think they can shoot a packet from New York to London in 43 milliseconds, whereas conventional existing Internet can only do 76. So this is noticeably better. When you're talking about zillions of transactions per month, this is going to make you more money if you are a speed-based um, trader. So... And, uh, yeah, but I'm personally, I'm more interested in having amazing internet in Carbondale. Um, and this is like the test ring. This is, they don't, this is all they have up right now is, I don't know if they even have this many up, but the background of this slide is the actual Starlink test satellites in orbit. You see this line moving here? I should have made the text hideable. Um, you can see them moving there. That's actual Starlink being tested. And... Here's the reason that SpaceX thinks this is worth doing, because it's going to cost them billions. It costs an amazing amount to shoot things into space. Um, but the good news is SpaceX owns Falcon 9 rockets, so they can essentially launch Starlink into space at cost. They're not paying for the service. They just got to pay for the fuel and the, the work to get it done. So they think they can put a full planet-wide Starlink network. They skip Antarctica, but uh, the rest of the planet's covered for 10 billion which sounds like an amazing amount of money until you consider that the reason we don't have 5g across the entire country is because it's really expensive to upgrade the entire country or the entire planet sorry to 5g would be 150 billion so starlink is in fact cheaper this is it, this is sort of a grand scale version of when we first invented wi-fi and we were like oh we could run Ethernet to every office in the building, but we'd have to drill holes in walls. We'd have to run wires through ceilings or floors. We'd have to do a ton of physical infrastructure building, like power conduits, cooling, uh, everything. And you could just set up Wi-Fi routers, right? It was quicker and easier. And this is the same principle on a planetary scale. It's pretty ambitious. And this video at the bottom is like 15 minutes. If you're interested in Starlink, highly recommend you read it. If you're interested in being a network tech, um, read it, watch it. If you're interested in being a pro network tech of any type, this is the future. This is one of the craziest things we've attempted with regards to the internet and you should know about it. 
uh, you should be able to talk about it in your job interviews or wherever else you go to talk to network nerds. Okay, some common problems that ISPs face. Well, customer equipment, if you're in support, you know that customer equipment is the scariest crap in the world. People don't take care of their stuff. They don't update it. They don't want to update it. They don't want to keep it up to date. They don't clean it. It's, everything's dusty. Their cat might have peed in it. Customer equipment sucks. Um, so you want to keep them out of your equipment. The, the CBE is their problem. And your equipment as Verizon or Mediacom at the place, you want to kind of like lock it up and then go, here, dude, plug into this jack and stay out of our uh, wire box, please. Yeah, should only be serviced by your technicians. The other thing is, is they spend a lot on lobbying um, to get laws relaxed. There's not a 20 or 30 years ago when the internet was invented, there was basically no laws governing it. It was just this new thing. We didn't know what the hell to do with it. So you would sell stuff over state lines, not pay taxes. We do that now. You could buy internet and go anywhere you wanted. And that kind of struck a chord with the companies and they started doing kind of crappy stuff. Um, and we put the brakes on them. So then they, they did this and started spending amazing amounts of money lobbying Congress, trying to buy people. So in the early 2000s, Comcast is the first, Cox and Comcast are the first up to the plate here to screw the customer. And they're like, uh, you can't VPN unless you pay us an extra fee, which is saying like, if we're your water company and you put your water in a coffee cup, we're going to charge you twice as much for it. You know, forget you. That's not, not, not going for it. AT&T started blocking customers who had their own routers. No, you have to pay us for every single device in the house. If you're old enough to remember when that was the thing, it's annoying. We use, and that's why routers include the ability to spoof IPs. They can actually spoof another device's Mac and IP, pretend to be that device so that the ISP can't charge you for every little device in the house. I mean, I have like 30 devices in my house that have Wi-Fi. It would be amazingly expensive. Okay, 2005, they started blocking things that competed with their own products. Cool, cool, cool. Like, uh, you can drive on their own if you have a Ford, but if you have a Chevy, we have to pay a toll. And the, the American public, the worldwide public, kind of called bullshit on this. 2008, they start throttling things they don't like. Like, oh, this is taking a lot of bandwidth. Even though we're being paid to provide bandwidth, this thing that does the most of what we're being paid to do, we want to reduce that so we can be paid the same but do less work, provide less service. Cool, cool, cool. Um, Apple in 2009, I don't really remember this, but they blocked Skype because AT&T wanted them to and they wanted to sell the iPhone on AT&T and cut a deal with them. So just companies being kind of shitty. 2015, we finally put, you know, uh, net neutrality into place and said that you guys can't do this anymore. You sell the service to a customer, you build the road, you build the water pipe, and then you don't tell the customer where they can drive or how much, what they drink water in or what they if they water their plants or whatever. You don't tell people what to do with the thing they bought from you. They bought it from you, so now it's theirs. And, um, oh, why is that out of sequence? Uh, that kind of happened because they were throttling Netflix. They started throttling BitTorrent, and they started throttling Netflix. And they even lied to us because they own the uh, speed test websites, or they bought them. So you'd go to like speedtest.net or whatever, and you would test your Mediacom internet to see if it was operating at full speed. And the t speed test would come back, yeah, it totally is, totally fine. And then you try to go to Netflix and it would look like crap and buffering. And you'd ask Mediacom, why does Netflix not work well? And they're like, because Netflix sucks. They lied. They were throttling Netflix and they were hiding the fact that they did it with their speed test sites. So Netflix made their own speed test site. They put it on this called fast.com. It's still up. And it's on the same server as the Netflix video distribution. So if you're throttling Netflix.com because you're a bad little lying ISP, then you're also throttling fast.com. You can't help it. It's on the same IP, same device. So when you did fast.com, you would see that it was just crippled. Your internet was nowhere near the speed it should be. And this helped kind of expose their lies, force them to play ball, and net neutrality did it. But then, 
I mean, it has to be said, President Trump put this jackass in charge and he has repealed all of it. Companies could start doing this to us anytime they want now and they're already kind of working towards it. It's super annoying. I hate this guy. Um, he's really he's really hurt us to, to, to no public gain for sure. Okay. So, I mean... This is in the book, but it's sort of an advocacy thing. You should provide fair access to, if you're going to provide internet. You can provide utilization limits. You know, we got limits on our MiFi's and data limits on our phones. You might have a data cap on your home internet connection. Um, throttling, not a fan of that. I should probably just no throttling policy unless someone's going completely nuts. And I mean, you just make them buy a bigger connection. It's no big deal. And don't block anything, you know? Um, basically, if you're Verizon selling the Verizon Internet, don't block AT&T.com just because they also sell phones that compete with you. Don't be a turd. Okay, so uh, the quiz, I'm going to go make it available early because it just doesn't matter. During the quarantine, you guys have, you have a full two weeks to take the quiz. So no rush, but don't procrastinate. You know, you're all grown-ups. You can handle it. Um, but the quiz should be available. Go take it. And um, let me know if you have any questions. Email me. I'm checking my Johnny email every day. Some of you have emailed me questions about, oh, why did I do this on the test? Remember, if you got a lower grade than you think on the test, it's probably just because I haven't hand-graded it yet. d 2 will grades 75% of it. And then the parts it's not sure about, it just gives you a zero. So... Uh, yeah, if if a question asks something and the answer is router and you type capital R or uh, instead of lowercase r, it's like you're wrong. So I go back in and I hand correct those and your score will come up. And then if your final score, once I've corrected it, is still lower than you think it should be, talk to me. I got time. <laughs> we all got some of us have like plenty of time. I'm 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 very fortunate. I'm able to do most of my job from home. I barely have to go to to work i'm a remote desktop support technician now so bug me and i'll we'll get on discord or whatever medium you prefer and we'll go question by question I'll, and we'll talk about the ones you missed and uh i'll get you up to 100 percent on it okay we'll get you we'll get you fixed up okay so don't be shy uh be safe have fun and uh, uh